you've ever wanted to count yourself among the ranks of geniuses like Leonardo da Vinci, Margaret Atwood, and Frank Lloyd Wright, then you're in luck because there is at least one dimension in which you, me, and probably everyone watching this video is already like them. And that's because each one of these geniuses is or was a massive procrastinator. Da Vinci took 16 years to finish the Mona Lisa, which is to say that he died 16 years after he started it. And over the course of his life, he only finished a handful of projects, often leaving angry patrons scrambling to hire other people to finish the projects that eventually slipped from his attention. Likewise, the author Margaret Atwood is pretty open about the fact that she spends every morning procrastinating, only getting to work around three in the afternoon. And as the story goes, the architect Frank Lloyd Wright drew up the initial plans for the famous Falling Water House just hours before a scheduled meeting with the man who had commissioned it. Procrastination is a problem that plagues most of us to some degree. From famous polymaths and artists throughout history, to YouTubers ironically making videos about procrastination, to students just trying to get their homework done, almost all of us deal with it, along with its consequences, of which there are many. Despite the justifications that procrastinators love to make, like, I work well under pressure, man, it's fine. Research has shown that procrastination is significantly correlated with poor study habits, with depression, anxiety, lycanthropy, low self-esteem, and yes, I may have made one of those up, but the fact remains that procrastination is a damaging habit to be in. So over the course of the next three videos, we are going to dig deep into both the causes of procrastination and how we can finally overcome it. This video in particular will focus on the science of procrastination, and we're going to pull from a wide body of research to find out exactly why we tend to put off our work. As the ancient proverb goes, know thy enemy. Then in the next video, we're gonna go over several tactics you can use to stop procrastinating in the moment once you catch yourself doing it. And the final video will wrap things up by looking at how each of us can once and for all shed the label of procrastinator from our identities and permanently reduce our tendency to put things off. For now though, we are focused on the question of why. Why, why do we procrastinate? One of the most popular theories that attempts to gather and integrate the many potential answers to this question is called Temporal Motivation Theory, which was created by Dr. Piers Steele and which was most thoroughly explained in his book, The Procrastination Equation. As that book's title implies, Temporal Motivation Theory attempts to explain procrastination in terms of a formula, which aims to solve for a task's utility or the general motivation to do it. The higher the utility or the higher the motivation, the less likely someone is going to be to procrastinate on that particular task. And the elements of that equation include number one, expectancy, which is your belief that you can complete the task. Number two, value, which is how valuable the reward the task will give you is to you. Number three, impulsiveness, which is the likelihood that you're gonna be distracted by something that would give you instant gratification now. And finally, number four, there's delay, which is how long you're gonna to have to wait to get the reward. So to solve for motivation or utility, you simply set the equation up like this. And then if you wanna raise your motivation and stop procrastinating, you just need to figure out how to manipulate one or more of the equation's elements. For example, you could raise expectancy by getting clear on the details of your task or by breaking it down into little subtasks, each of which feels more actionable. Likewise, you could raise a task's value by setting up additional rewards for completing it, like giving yourself a pre-planned break once you finish it. And of course, you could lower impulsiveness by disconnecting from the internet or working on self-discipline exercises to make yourself less vulnerable to distractions or by changing your study location to increase the distance between you and your VR headset. And finally, there is delay, which is probably probably the hardest element in the equation to manipulate, since a lot of tasks have a set in stone due date, meaning there is a set in stone reward. Now, temporal motivation theory has its roots in behavioral economics, proposing that the reason we procrastinate is purely due to our current perceived utility of a task. And to be fair, it is a model that does a pretty good job at collecting many of the reasons we do tend to put things off. The expectancy piece accurately reflects the fact that we tend to be more resistant to starting a task when we know that it's difficult. Likewise, the value and delay variables reflect how we tend to opt for instant gratification over rewards whose value we don't much care about, or that we've discounted because it's far off in the future. But it's worth mentioning that this theory does have its critics, including Dr. Timothy Pitchell, who heads up the Procrastination Research Group at Carleton University. In a critique that he wrote for the website Psychology Today, Pitchell points out that in the attempt to unify everything under this utility-based equation, this theory ends up making too many assumptions. For one, it assumes that some tasks, like socializing with friends, have a fixed utility that isn't sensitive to delay, while others, like writing an essay, 
essay definitely are sensitive to that delay. And in fact, these two tasks are used together to form an example on Dr. Steele's website. According to the graph there, the utility of socializing remains higher than that of writing the essay until right near the due date, at which point the lines intersect and now it's time to start chugging Red Bulls and scrambling to finish that essay. But Pitchell's article asks what would happen if a party scheduled for this Friday were postponed to next week. Since this increases delay, the overall utility of socializing should be decreased and now the utility of writing the essay should be higher, which means that you should choose to do it, right? Of course, in the real world, most students wouldn't decide to work on an essay far in advance of the deadline just because a party got postponed. Now, for my part, I feel like Pitchell's critique of this one example isn't a perfect takedown because it kind of frames things as a binary choice. And in reality, I'm gonna be considering more options. If a party gets postponed, I'm probably still gonna consider playing Overwatch all night rather than just choosing to do the essay. Still, I do agree with his overall conclusion where he says, the point is that complex human behaviors are not best understood by simple equations or formulae. Although although the theories that these formulae represent can be useful in our discussion of behavior. And I especially agree with this view that temporal motivation is just a little too focused on this idea of people as rational decision makers, carefully weighing different actions like ingots on a scale, because that isn't how it works. We humans with our squishy multi-layered brains are a lot more irrational than economic theories would like to paint us. At all times, the rational part of your brain is locked in an eternal struggle with the more instinctual emotional side. And it's this emotional side that plays the biggest role in our tendency to procrastinate, especially for people that have a hard time regulating it. In a study that was published back in 2001, the researcher Diane Tice found that students who are primed to believe their mood was fixed or frozen were less likely to seek instant gratification or to procrastinate, while students who were led to believe that their moods could be changed were much more likely to do both. And even though procrastinators tend to feel guilt when they do this, they, or we, I should say, actually, because I do this too, we tend to rationalize it and we convince ourselves that it's really not a big deal. For an example of this, a study done at Bishop University had students react to scenarios where procrastination had actually caused a problem or at least exacerbated it, including a scenario where somebody had come back from a Sunday vacation with a suspicious mole, but then put off going to the doctor to have it checked out for quite a long time. And in reaction to that scenario, the chronic procrastinators in the group tended to say things like, at least I went to the doctor before I got really, really bad, instead of saying things like, if only I'd gone to the doctor sooner. All their statements tended to be what are called downward counterfactuals, which are responses that reflect the desire to improve one's mood in the short term. And these are in contrast to, you guessed it, upward counterfactuals, which are responses that tend to embrace difficulties now in an attempt to learn something new about the future. As the head researcher for the study put it, procrastinators focused on how to make themselves feel better at the expense of drawing insight from what made them feel bad. Despite the guilt that we feel, this habitual urge to seek an emotional pick-me-up in response to a task that's boring or difficult, or in response to anxiety, causes us to construct arguments that rationalize our procrastination and keep us in a never-ending cycle of doing it. And those studies are just the start, because there is even more evidence to support this idea of procrastination as primarily an issue of emotional regulation. For instance, a study from Brooklyn College back in 2010 found a significant link between procrastination problems and problems with executive functioning, which is an umbrella term for all the higher cognitive functions that control our behavior. When the researchers first tested students on procrastination and then on nine scales of executive functioning, such as self-monitoring and emotional control and organization, they found a significant link between problems with procrastination and all nine of these scales. And another study even found a biological link. When a research team over in Germany did fMRI brain scans on 264 adults, they found a link between difficulties in initiating action on tasks and a greater volume of gray matter in the amygdala, which is the brain's fight or flight center. Though it is worth mentioning just a couple of things about this study. The first of which being that the results merely show an association rather than claiming a direct causal link. And the second being a reminder that the physical structure of the brain is in fact quite adaptable. In fact, a study done back in 2013 showed how just eight weeks of training in mindfulness meditation can actually shrink the volume of the amygdala. And as the study notes, as the amygdala shrinks, the prefrontal cortex associated with higher order brain functions such as awareness, concentration, and decision-making becomes thicker. And I think that this is very important to include because while all of us are born with different brains, we're also born with brains that can in fact change, adapt, and improve. So to sum things up, the current body of procrastination research seems to point the finger primarily at an inability to self-regulate emotions and mood as the cause. When you're a chronic procrastinator, you consistently give in to feel good, even though you are keenly aware of the harm you're causing and even though you feel guilty about it. 
And make no mistake, even the greats felt guilty about it. In fact, Walter Isaacson's biography on Leonardo da Vinci makes this pretty clear, stating the most obvious evidence that he was human rather than superhuman is the trail of projects he left unfinished. Tell me if anything was ever done. He repeatedly scribbled in notebook after notebook. Tell me, tell me, tell me if I ever did a thing. Tell me if anything was ever made. Of course, this primary reason is connected to other causes as well, such as those problems with executive functioning and the expectancy, value, and delay issues laid out by temporal motivation theory, and by how close we are to our distractions, as well as how addicted we are to them, which I think is an important point to note since now, more than ever, our distractions are specifically engineered to keep us coming back again and again. Now, in the next video in the series, we're gonna dig into some specific tactics that you can use to stop procrastinating in the moment when you notice yourself doing it. But before we end this video, I do wanna address one of the most common fixes for procrastination that I see being touted on the internet, which is to simply go and do the work that you love, to follow your passion, because if you're procrastinating right now, it means you're doing the wrong work and you need to quit. <sighs> If only it were that easy. But alas, even people who are quote unquote following their passion have elements of their work that they tend to procrastinate on. I mean, most of these people would probably feel pretty silly telling Margaret Atwood that the work she spent her life doing is in fact the wrong work for her because she procrastinates on it. More importantly though, this is just dangerous advice. Sure, occasionally you're gonna see somebody who quit everything, dropped out of school and went all in on underwater game development. And they made millions of dollars and became an inspiration to us all. Those are the stories that get told, but they are the exception to the rule. And as the author Barbara Oakley wisely points out in her book, A Mind for Numbers, over the past decades, students who have blindly followed their passion without rational analysis of whether their career choice truly was wise have been more unhappy with their job choices than those who coupled passion with rationality. A better path is to dedicate your free time to exploring your interests and passions and to double down on the ones that you seem especially interested in. And by deliberately learning what triggers your procrastination with your main work, and then by learning to combat those triggers, which is what the other two videos in this series will be about, you're gonna find yourself with more of that free time than you would have otherwise had. Of course, another way to start moving something that you're passionate about from being just a side project to becoming something that eventually may be something you could turn into a career is to accelerate your skill development in that area by learning from expert teachers. For example, if you eventually wanted to build your own successful YouTube channel, then you might wanna learn about content creation from somebody who already does that for a living. And fortunately, my friend Evan, who runs the excellent channel Polymatter, recently released a course over on Skillshare that talks all about how to do that. Evan's course covers the entire creation process for making an animated YouTube video, starting from topic selection and research, then moving on into story crafting, and finally heading on into a section about how to actually make the animations. And one thing that I was really surprised to learn, especially given how smooth and awesomely animated Evan's videos are, is how simple his process for making those animations actually is. And beyond Evan's course, you're also gonna find over 24,000 different classes in Skillshare's library covering UX and design, productivity, entrepreneurship, and tons of other topic areas. Plus, classes are hands-on, all of them feature projects, and many have downloadable example files so you can immediately start using what you're learning and learn actively. A membership to Skillshare is also really affordable, costing about as much as your Netflix subscription, but of course being a lot more useful to your future skill development. And what's best, if you use the link in the description down below and sign up, you're gonna get two months of completely unlimited access to their library for free. So if you wanna start accelerating your skill development today, then definitely use that link below and sign up because there is a lot that you could learn in two months. Big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this episode. And as always, thank you guys for watching. If you like this video, definitely hit that like button to support this this channel. And if you want to make sure you get notifications, especially for the next two videos in this series about how to stop procrastinating in the moment and then how to become less of a chronic procrastinator long term, you're definitely going to want to get subscribed right there and possibly hit that bell for notifications. You can also click right there to get a free copy of my book on how to earn better grades in school, whether you're in high school or college, I think you're going to find it very useful. You can also follow me on Instagram at Tom Frankly. And when those other two videos in the series go live, I'm going to have them right here on screen. Until then, there's probably one other video that you may want to watch if you haven't seen it already. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.